My name is Sarah Moriarty. I am the executive director of Charleston Literary Festival. It is an honor to welcome you all here on this, the last Friday of our festival, seven days in. I hope you're having a wonderful time. I certainly am. Quick housekeeping before we kick off this session. First thing is, I would like everybody to turn off their phones. Let's get everybody on mute, please. Ringer off, phones off. Second thing is, if you would like to debrief on this session, you can uh, have some concessions that are on sale out in the courtyard um, at the back. So we are selling concessions at the back. Feel free to have a coffee and have a chat after the session. And the final thing is, and this is one more um, shameless plug from Charleston Literary Festival, we are selling merchandise this year. We have hats, we have bags, Christmas is coming, the holidays are coming. Feel free to indulge for yourself or someone you know. So with all of that said, hello everybody. It is a huge honor for me to welcome you all to this Charleston Literary Festival event featuring Paul Harding <laughs> in conversation. <laughs> featuring Paul Harding in conversation with Jeffrey Harpham with readings by Eduardo Ballerini. Jeffrey Harpham is President Emeritus of the National Humanities Centre in North Carolina and Senior Fellow at Duke University. Harpham is the author of several groundbreaking scholarly books, including The Humanities and the Dream of America, Language Alone, The Critical Fetish of Modernity, and Scholarship and Freedom. Our reader, Eduardo Ballerini, is two-time winner of the Audio Publishers Association's Best Male Narrator Award and the, and the voice of over 400 audiobooks. He is currently shortlisted for a Grammy for his recording of Cormac McCarthy's Stella Maris, and he is the narrator of the audiobook for our featured title this afternoon, This Other Eden. And that brings me to Paul Harding, a drummer in a former life. Paul is the author of Tinkers, which won the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, and the novel Enon. He's currently the director of the Creative Writing and Literature MFA program at Stony Brook, Southampton. Inspired by the true story of Malaga Island off the coast of Maine, This Other Eden tells the story of Apple Island, where in 1792, Benjamin Honey, a formerly enslaved man, arrives with his Irish wife, Patience, and together they build a life. More than a century later, the Honey's descendants face the intrusion of civilization as officials move to cleanse the island. It's not an overstatement to say that this novel has been hugely, incredibly well received. It is shortlisted for the Booker Prize this year. It is also a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction this year. And the Booker Prize lauded it for celebrating the hopes, dreams, and resilience of those deemed not to fit in a world brutally intolerant of difference. Join me in welcoming Paul Harding, Jeffrey Harpham, with Eduardo Ballerini. Benjamin Honey, American Bantu Igbo, born enslaved, freed or fled at 15, only he ever knew, ship's carpenter, aspiring orchidist, arrived on the island with his wife Patience, nay Rafferty, Galway girl, in 1793. He brought his bag of tools, gifts from a grateful captain he had saved from drowning or plunder from a ship on which he had mutinied and murdered the captain, depending on who said, and a watertight wooden box containing 12 jute pouches. Each pouch held seeds for a different variety of apple. Honey collected the seeds during his years as a field worker and later as a sailor. He remembered being in an orchard as a child, although not where or when with his mother, or with the woman whose face over the years had become what he pictured as his mother's. And he remembered the fragrance of the trees and their fruits. The memory became a vision of the garden to which he meant to return. No mystery, it was Eden. Years passed and he added seeds to his collection. He recited the names at night before he slept. Ashmead's Colonel, Flower of Kent, Duchess of Oldenburg, and Warner's King. Ballyfatten, Cat's Head. 
After Benjamin and Patience Honey arrived on the island, hardly 300 feet across a channel from the mainland, just under 42 acres, 1,200 feet across, east to west, and 1,500 feet long, north to south, uninhabited then, the only human trace an abandoned Penobscot shell berm. And after they had settled themselves, he planted his apple seeds. Not a seed grew. <laughs> Thank you, Eduardo. Paul Harding, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, your book is called This Other Eden, and it's a striking title. Do we need another Eden? Didn't we have? <laughs> One was more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it seems to me a, a very brave and bold gesture to title a book This Other Eden, because it seems like there's the, the seed of an argument there, or some, some microbe of discontent with the first Eden. Is that your intention? I don't know. It's, it's meant to be sort of open-ended and resonant in certain different ways. I mean, if you, if you look at the original Eden in the Bible, Eden lasted for about four hours, you know? <laughs> so it was like one afternoon. And the, yeah. um, um, but the title actually comes from a line spoken by Richard of Gaunt, who I'll recall, um, in Richard II. Um, and he's sort of lamenting what he thinks England's fate is in that yeah. play. Um, and so he li runs this list of the virtues of England, this other Eden being one of them, and then his monologue ends with him saying sort of all sold for a tenant farm or something like that. Right. And so that just struck me as the idea of the place, you know, the island that I was writing about um, was, you know, it was hardly an Eden, but it was sort of sold down the river for you know, supposedly tourism development. I hadn't expected an allusion to Richard II. I thought it would be. <laughs> Neither did I. I mean, these things sort of just pop up and you grab them as they, you know. But your, your work has seemed to me brave in another respect. Uh, you must be aware that it excites very, very divergent reactions from people and has from the beginning. Uh, a friend of mine, when he heard that I was going to be interviewing you, said, uh, that book? That book? I hated that book. I picked it up at 10 pages in. I, I thought, I'm never going to read this again. And he put it aside. But the next day, his wife came along and picked it out of you know, the ashes or wherever he'd thrown it, and she totally loved it. <laughs> yeah, this... He said, in 38 years of wedded bliss, this is our first disagreement. <laughs> I, th I, th I think the marriage has survived, but they're both walking around wondering, do I really know this person at all? <laughs> and, and your work has that capacity to, to, to strike deep, uh, not only deep into uh, a, a reader, but deep into their allegiances and their convictions and their deepest beliefs about things. And that's why I began by talking about the biblical Eden, because this is so deep in our cultural subconscious that to invoke another Eden is to dredge up the depths immediately. Mm -hmm, sure. Well, I think that there's, I mean, speaking of the book being a finalist for these prizes, you know, one of the things about, you know, pr prizes and taste in, in literature is, um, on the one hand, when I talk to my students about writing, I just say, don't write your books for the people who won't like them. You don't have to like my book. You can say, I don't like your book. I'll say, good, let's go out and have a drink and talk about baseball or something. I don't yeah. care. You know, but, um, but uh, like everybody else, every year I see who wins the, pr the literary right. prizes, right. and half the time I'm like, that charlatan won? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the other half of the time I'm like, Art is safe for another year, so there would be no exception for my books. I should be so lucky that people are sort of, you know, throwing it out the window but, but or whatever, you know, talking about it. It's, it fine. it's one sign of a really important project that it divides people like that and provokes sharp opinions, isn't it? It seems to me that, that one thing you're doing in this book is not only reimagining an historical event, uh, the evacuation of Malaga Island, which is not far from where you, uh, you grew up, but also you're you're undertaking a, a meditation on origins, and through that, a, a kind of rethinking of the, of the human condition. Is that too vast and ponderous? No. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, you know, it is, it's one of those enough. things that we were just talking about that backstage. <laughs> nope. Um, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, I teach Shakespeare, I teach the Old Testament, I think, you know, I read a lot of literature, and I think about, um, one of the things to me is oh, that's fascinating about, you know, and it's sort of a literary figure as well, but how the infinitesimal breaks open into the infinite. And so the idea that you have this one 
very radically fictionalized sort of you know, historical, very local, very intimate, kind of on the level of a dozen people practically in the book, um, that to me immediately started to resonate on greater and greater, it's infinitely sort of scalable. So it, was, it felt like very local, familial, communal, regional, and then the United States and the history of enslavement, and then back to Eden, the essential, you know, displacement, and the idea that it was, it was connected in this unbroken line of, um, so, so, so it felt, so, felt perennial and universal in a certain way, and so as a novelist, that's just catnip, um, because then you can just spend eight or 10 years under my respective rock, just thinking about how how these resonances elaborate themselves. But when you take on the Bible, you take on like the Ur myth, at least of the Christian West, don't you? And, and so you begin at the beginning by reimagining it and, and, and envisioning an alternative account of human origins, which has endless repercussions in terms of our understanding of the human condition. Yeah, again, I think of it as a, um, you know, as an artist or a novelist or a writer, you know, I end up with these very, very personal sort of metaphors that sort of fall apart if you push too hard on them. But I kept thinking of it as like a relay of different lenses of thinking about, because even Moses, when he was writing about Eden, he's just repurposing even older Babylonian and Egyptian. So it goes back even farther than that, but then you see Shakespeare repurposing Moses and Melville repurposing Shakespeare and Faulkner repur you know, and Toni Morrison and Emily Dickinson you know just uh, and just that idea of uh, that unbroken tradition with which I wanted to align myself and my writing and that sort of thing but also just the idea that it's um, that each generation each each culture each place each time inherits all of that and does its own thing with it as well. So it's, I, I love that, it, it's almost paradoxical, but it's, it's both, it's, it's universal and utterly felt, utterly experienced by each particular person, family, generation, community. But each differently. Yeah, in each, right, absolutely. In each iteration uniquely. or reiteration, there's a difference of some kind. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that, that has always troubled readers of the first Eden was how the earth became populated. I know that there's an allusion to the wife of Cain, who comes from someplace else, we're not quite certain. But if we, if we think of Adam and Eve as the primal pair, as the progenitors, the implication is that there's some incest there, and that Cain and Eve, I guess, populated the world. And that's always been very troubling to people, and, and you take that up in your book. To some extent, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, there are all sorts of different vectors of that. I mean, I think if you follow it through the Old Testament, <laughs> there is that sort of like, wait, these people are all cousins, aren't they? They're sort of, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, partly that's just you're going from this kind of mythopoetic folktale thing into something like proto-history and then history. And, <laughs> and so a lot of those earliest books of the Bible, they just say, you know, never mind, you know, this, because there's, you know, cities and stuff in the background. That, you know, you don't, it's, it, it, they're work, it, it's working on more of a poetic kind of level. Um, but then um, um, I think that one of the things that ends up, that, that interested me about this island and the fictional version of it that I cooked up over these years, is I thought of it almost, I thought of the island itself in different ways, one of which was, it's almost like Noah's Ark. You have the small population, they're on the ark, but what happens if you can't get off the ark? Um, and then that just looped back into some of those early Old Testament biblical stories about, you have all these stories about Israel, which is this vanishingly small population that is really just regularly in, the, in all of the stories that, you know, in, in the Old Testament, you know, facing imminent extinction. And in a lot of these very crucial moments and episodes, the only way to save Israel is Lot's daughters sleep with their father. You know, Tamar sleeps with, oh no, Reuben? I can't remember so much Judah, um, and um, and so e just even that the idea that um, you're facing extinction, um, uh, uh, it's the idea of just like uh, rather than the opposite, what the condition these people find themselves in is rather than being able to satisfy, they be fruitful and multiply, and you know just be, be robust, big extended family, we're all one another as brothers and sisters and cousins, 
if the Noah version is, um, that they are sort of oppressed or forced into this kind of, they're, they start to um, impact, they start to disappear. Well, in fact, there's an extremely interesting passage that I'll ask Eduardo to read, uh, where one character, Esther, who is herself, we'll say, a victim of incest, uh, meditates on her family, but she doesn't meditate going forward, she meditates going back. Have you got that, Eduardo? Yeah. Esther had heard a visiting relative once talk about going to a big reunion on her husband's side of the family. There were more than a hundred people, she'd said. Many of them looked exactly alike, but many of them you'd never tell were related. A family so big you had to have special reunions of them. They'd spread so far and wide. What it must have been like to have a family that large and get back together with them like that. Their family on the island was always so small, seemingly getting smaller compacting, members converging into one another. So few of them, they'd begun to be more than one relation to one another at a time. Men becoming their daughters, fathers, and husbands. Mothers being their sons, sisters. The family condensing, imploding. Fewer and fewer people becoming heavier and heavier until one last woman would stand, dark and wholly compacted, herself begat, she her own mother. She, her own daughter and sister, all in her one, impossibly condensed and sorrowful body, leaden and involute, so when she lay down to die, no one would need to bury her. She would just sink into the ground like a millstone plunging through silty water. What a beautiful voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I should just say that two, that brings two things to mind, which is that Eduardo's reading is incredible, it's just absolutely amazing, and that my next project is going to be a musical comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I think he can sing, too. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the larks, because incest is not only a means of survival, it's also a means of ensuring the extinction of the line, and the larks are one family that seem to have this burden. I, yeah, they're, they're um, uh, uh, one of the, to me, interesting things about this is that, the, that on the one hand, this, you know, incest becomes, is an accusation, you know, it is something that is, that is, um, it's an accusation that's leveled at these people as, as almost, um, uh, something that indicates them as being almost subhuman, um, and, um, that they've passed below some sort of threshold of hu human behavior, um, but that, on the other hand, all of the the, the kind of antagonists towards the towards these um, people in the book um, are obsessed with the purity of blood, which is traditionally conserved by incest among the most elite people in the world, Cleopatra, all of the you know the royal families, and so there's a kind of bitter irony to that that to me. One of the things in the book, though, is that one of the ways I just you know, you think about sort of these these things that are meant to be bad and that people, people um, uh, um, emphasize in, or at the expense of the humanity of these, of these islanders. One of the things, if you take a look at the book, um, the, it, there's one sentence that mentions that there's incest between these people and their family, and then the, then the book just treats them like uh, you know, ca uh, characters, the ones that they just sort of know. And the Lark family is a di a kind of a, just a combination of different, the, the, the husband who wears a gingham dress is um, just, uh, and this is just to show you, this is how sort of mundane a lot of this is. I, um, there's a writer named Guy Davenport who, is, um, who I was um, uh, read, pondered for a lot of my life, and he has an extraordinary two-page story called a gingham dress about a young kid boy who's dressed in a gingham dress and his, his grandfather or something was a shopkeeper was he yeah he's a shop right he's a shopkeeper and sort of takes over the shopkeeping apron and this sort of thing and then there's a, a, a one of the patron writers or saints or angels of the of of uh this other eden was also the um writer sarah orne jewett who right, this, to me a neglected american masterpiece called in the country of the pointed furs. But she also wrote short stories, and one of her short stories is about a man who's living in a very, very remote um, you know, place in Maine. Um, and he had been living with his sister, and his sister died, and he was so sort of disfigured by grief at losing her that he began to wear her dresses and sort of become, he was her, 
himself and his sister at once. So I just just blended that in. Right. And I mentioned that he was a shopkeeper because Theophilus, is that how I said Yeah, yeah. He has this curious greeting. Yeah, and whenever, and I, he remembers it from, I think, from his, his mother or grandfather, whoever it was that, you know, the family once had a kind of a, just a country store, and he would greet every, every potential customer with, what lackey, sir or ma'am? That's lackey? right, she comes in the store and she says, what lackey, ma'am? And he greets his children in this way, too. What lackey, my little oysters? <laughs> my little salted <laughs> cods. <laughs> so, 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 if I'm comparing this other Eden, this island with this 20 or so people on it, who have been, many of whom have been there for over a century, with the first Eden, by way of drawing the contrast, I see that the, the possibility of incest that is in the first biblical Eden is actually realized in this other Eden. And also the, 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 the violence that is post-Edenic in the Bible is on this other Eden. Uh, Esther kills her father slash husband on the day of the birth of her child. So you have incest, you have patricide, but most importantly, uh, I think, to you, is the fact that you've got this tremendous mixture of people. There is Igbu, there is Bantu, there is Irish, there is Penobscot, there is American of various kinds. And this all seems to be symbolized in a flag that Patience Honey stitches right at the beginning, out of bits of things, you know, an igbu piece, piece of clothing, you know, and, and a scotch piece of clothing, and a, and a bit of an American flag. And this flag comes up at the beginning, at the middle, and then at the very end as yeah. uh, the last character marches into this. So there seems to be a message that in your other Eden, there is incest, there is violence, and there is mixture. In other words, we don't start out pure and fall into diversity and violence and sinfulness. We start out that way. It's, it's not that deliberate. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't, you know, it's, um, there's, it's, this is one of the funny things about, you know, being an artist or being a, you know, right, like I, I, to me, the idea of writing a book with a message is fatal. Um, and part, it's just as much, it's, again, it's not very noble of me, but I just feel like if you get the message, you never have to look at the book again. You never have to think about it. So I had this idea of, you know, opening up all of these, um, you know, l l l cast the first stone. Everybody is, no, no, we're, there's nobody without, without sin. And I, I'm interested more in the idea of, um, or uh, all these different ideas. But, you know, I was just interested in just following these people mostly on the, in their day-to-day -day lives, just being family members, being friends, just trying to sort of sur survive together. Pushing without, each other off cliffs. Yeah, pushing each other off <laughs> cliffs and all this sort of stuff. But, um, but the idea that, um, that um, uh, um, I mean, on the one hand, you know, just the, the way that we... I mean, I guess, you know, thinking about it, now I've got the Old Testament on my mind, but, you know, the idea that, you know, one of the things that will invoke, you know, the fire and brimstone of God more than anything else is the withholding or degradation of somebody else's humanity in order to confirm your own, and the fact that there's nothing easier than doing that, that we, you know, um, and that, uh, and so the idea of, of, um, of, of, you know, degrading other people for these things, um, which you know, you are not without sin or whatever. I don't mean to be, you know, this isn't church necessarily, but you know, just that, that, just that idea. And then also the idea too that um, I mean, I'm fascinated by the fact too that we we all sort of, um, in certain ways, know better than how we actually act as well. So there's that idea of, I know I shouldn't be doing this. I know I shouldn't be. There's a missionary character who's just like, I know I probably shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyways. And so just that, 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 the tension, that, that, the, the drama between either, you know, no, knowing better and not acting accordingly, um, or, or the, the drama also of just, um, just falling into the temptation of uh, you know, trying to exalt yourself at the expense of somebody else's yeah. humanity. Uh, perhaps the most striking difference between this other Eden and the first Eden is that in this Eden there is no fall, except I guess Esther's father <laughs> who falls when he push, she pushes him off a cliff. But there, there's, there's no initial <laughs> state of purity from which we then descend and that, 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 that collapse into sinfulness or that yielding to temptation explains all the 
crap around us, it starts out in this very fallen, diverse, complicated, not nonviolent condition. And if you start out with a fall, then there's always a temptation to try to make humanity great again by getting back to that point mm -hmm. of purity and contact with God, whereas your other Eden kind of forecloses on that possibility, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, for me, that goes back to why the Bible was pretty careful about just saying it only lasted about four hours. Yeah. <laughs> it just wasn't, you know. Right. And I think it's, it's, again, it's that poetic idea of, of um, that, that that the story of that fall is, occurs in the dimension of, po of poetry and of myth, um, because the minute you put it into history, then you start thinking, oh, there must be some historical material way to get back to that yeah. perfect yeah. state, and that's when you know, people start getting thrown into ovens or whatever, you know, like it's dangerous, it's a very dangerous um, idea if you try to historicize it. But also, it's one of those funny things, I mean, I'm always trying to make what I'm working with, like just take it, make it, take advantage of its in inherent complexity so that it actually gets away from being vulnerable to me kind of over-determining anything about it, right? And so just, I want it to be smarter than I am. I want it to be more sophisticated, more, more um, complicated. And so one of the things, I mean, I was sawing away at the thing and didn't know what the title would be, and I came out, oh, Shakespeare, that'll be good. If you look at the, you know, like this, it's like eight books right now that are you know, riffs on Shakespeare. It's like, how original of me. But, um, but one of the things that I realized, and I, I was looking for, like, the book is smarter than I am, and one of the things that struck me, like, when I was, you know, doing galley corrections was there's actually an interlude that happens in the middle of the book where a very, this young kid, one of the, ki somebody from the island who kind of presents as white, he's sort of sent off and spend, is supposed to spend a summer painting on this estate that's actually from one of my previous novels, and he and this um, young girl, um, uh, you know, fall into a romance they're in their teens, you know, um, and um, uh, and w when their romance is discovered, they're both sort of exiled from the from the um, from the estate. And I realized that's the other Eden. That's the Eden. There's uh, two kind of relatively innocent people, and they have this very what I think, tried to make a lovely little romance. And then it's the, the you know they themselves are displaced. Um, and I always like that. I like that when the, the book did something smarter than I could have deliberately intellectually made up for it. You know, the, the thing about the four-hour interval, as you calculate it uh, in, in the first Eden, is that nothing bad happens in it. And so we're, we're always tempted to say, you know, if we could only get back to that yeah. point, or get back to that point any time in the past when things used to be great again. But the Eden that you described, nobody would choose to live like that, would they? Nobody could. It's not even an option. It's, but nobody would choose to. No, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, the people from the mainland who come and look at these people who have been living completely on their own and by themselves for a long time, they see a bunch of shabby, peculiar, ill-educated, ill-fed uh, uh, people. It's not a survivable population. And you wouldn't attribute any particular virtue to it. But it does have traces of emotions and feelings and movements of the heart that we have to acknowledge as, as being beautiful. Like there's love, there's... You know. Yeah, I mean, with, any, with this sort of thing, you know, you, you also have to be careful about not overly romanticizing it, not fetishizing it, not making it so tragic that they're not human beings, they're just victims, that sort of thing. I mean, again, why... My attitude is, if, if I'm minute I had the idea for this novel, I was like, this is going to be way too difficult to write, which is like quality control. You try it, give it a shot. But, um, but the idea that, um, um, that, uh, uh, that there are, different, there are different possible really catastrophic ways that the, if I put the book together, that the book would be vulnerable to really catastrophic readings, you know, one of which would have been to 225 page book, the sort of terrible violent things that happened to the characters are maybe eight pages in the book. I knew that really the way to just make these characters human and to just privilege, you know, partly what you do is you just say that I'm against the dehumanization of people, you know, whatever, I'm a writer, we spend so much People spend so much time objectifying one another. I think of my job as a novelist is to subjectify people, like to just put human beings on the page. And by just privileging them, 
that in itself is a gesture against the, for, the antagonist that would just dehumanize them. Um, because if, I, if there was too much violence, it would just be sensationalistic and gratuitous. And then you know, along the same lines, the, the true subject of the book had to be these people and their lives, just as human beings, just as human beings. You know, the value is just inherent. Right. Um, and that... Um, Even um, the most unpromising looking human being. You know, unpromising to whom? That's the other thing is, you know, the idea of like, these people live on the margins. Whose margins? You know, if you ask them, they'd be like, y'all live on my margins. You know, that kind of thing. And so the idea that... Um, you know, and again, this is just you know, writing about this kind of stuff. You know, I just had to really try to ensure as much as possible that nobody could, no reasonable person could read the book and come away thinking that the true subject of the book was their own righteous indignation on behalf of, on behalf of the characters. There's a meditation on precisely this subject that uh, is the subject of the last passage that Eduardo will read, and I'll ask you to comment on that when he's done. Zachary Hand to God Proverbs lived in a hollow oak tree. At least he spent as much time in the tree as the weather would allow without freezing to death. The tree stood on a rise on the lower southeast edge of the island, with its opening in the lee of the prevailing winds. Zachary was a master carpenter and woodworker, and his one-room shack sat back from the tree, nestled in a granite hollow, sound and sealed and square, built by Zachary himself with the tools Benjamin Honey himself had first brought to the island. Like that of everyone else on Apple Island, Zachary's age was a mystery, or unknown in any case, not a mystery to himself or the other islanders, because none of them followed any calendar, and keeping track of how many years old somebody was never occurred to them. It would have been a mystery to them why someone would bother doing such a thing, as a matter of fact. Whatever age he was, Zachary was old, older than Esther Honey, who was probably the next oldest islander left, old enough to have come to the island as a very young, woman, a young man in January of 1866 after the war ended and after the 29th Connecticut Colored Infantry Regiment he'd fought in had been decommissioned because he'd heard about the island from one of the Virginians he'd fought alongside who'd said his father had known a man named Honey a long time ago who it was said had gone north and founded an all-colored town on an island. Zachary had lived his entire life on Apple Island since then. Neither Zachary nor anyone else on the island thought of him as a hermit, though he spent his time in the tree pondering the meaning of creation, the meaning of his and his fellow islanders' mean existences, and carving scenes from the Bible into the insides of the tree. Thank you. <clears throat> you want to comment on that all? Um, Again, this is, I'm, this is just between us, right? Because this is, I can't let my, see. The, the, that was a case of, um, um, I had been doing a book tour for a previous book. I was in Toronto. I went to, I think it's called the University of Ontario. And they had an extraordinary, I don't know if it's a part of the permanent collection or what, but there's an extraordinary um, collection of um, medieval ivory carvings these incredibly intricate, ornate, beautiful um, scenes uh, from the Bible and of kind of like galleries and the architecture. Is really, and I just thought it'd be really cool if I had a character who could do that in a tree. That's what it started <laughs> off with, you know? And then so you start from that little germ right. and then you just say, okay, I'm just gonna stick with a scene where how is he doing this and how does it, and it slowly elaborates and you become implicated in in what he's trying to do, you know, you, you, be, you, you what is he trying to do here? And he's not quite sure. And then, you, you know, this character emerges, and I thought he's older than he fought in the, in, in the Civil War, and um, you know, he himself is almost like kind of a prophet figure in a certain way. Um, and there's a, he, the, he and Esther, this character named Esther Honey. I, you know, I think a lot about prophecy again, because no, <laughs> but as one does, but. Um, one of the qualities of being a prophet in the Bible is not that you have some supernatural ability to tell the future. The, the, the kind of defining quality of prophecy is that you can see the present clearly. You speak truth to power. You see the present clearly. And if you see, so you, it's not that you can predict what will be, it's that you can see where it's at. You know where it's at. And if you know where it's at, there's no mystery where it's gonna go. You know, and so that idea of the, these clear-eyed 
people who have great intelligence, great per perception, know exactly what their situation is and can just see the writing on the wall before anybody else. Probably. I would suggest that the, the peculiar power of your prophecy is an ability to see into the past, like the deep past, the archaic past. But I'd like to talk about this quality of vision that you're alluding to, because the, the book is filled with passages where people see things. And it seems to me like, if this is a book about origins, you're, you're exploring the kind of primitive or primordial act of apprehending things as if for the first time. You know, people see things as if for the first time. I want to talk about that a little bit. Although I think that maybe that, again, that might be just a pretty um, straightforward, uh, in some ways, straight, initially straightforward anyways, consequence of just what I, what I feel like I had to habituate myself to doing as a writer. You know, so much of what we think of as thinking or seeing or perceiving yeah. is actually just habitual because, you know, you've got to get to work, right? <laughs> but then as a novelist or whatever, you know, I spent a lot of time just thinking, oh, well, what have I, what I think about that is actually not really thought. What I think I see, would, and that is actually partly to do also with how you go into a fictional world and find characters, and you're trying to find human beings, and if I, oh, here's the thing, here's a, Here's a, here's a plot, and it has to do with mixed race characters, and we know, you know the, the history of the United States. And so the idea of like going in and acting, just orienting myself as if I already knew what I was gonna see. Right. You know, you have to like, you have to, it's actually a deliberate skill that I, had to, I felt like I had to learn how to do as a writer, which was to, which was to shed any kind of um, presumption and just really, like, I think of myself, I literally think of myself as, like, opening a trap door in the world and climbing down in into the fictional world with my legal pad and my pen or pencil. Got to be. Um, and just my job is to sit down and to shut up and to look and listen very carefully and don't coerce any of my characters into saying lines I've made up for them ahead of time and just being very solicitous and courteous of their dignity and you know being very respectful, yeah. and then letting it just kind of elaborate. Again, it takes you know it takes me forever to do, but then feeling like it, every one of the things that you know a lot of that drives me crazy about a lot of fiction writers is they they come up and they say I became a fiction writer because I'm a pathological liar. Ha ha, you know <laughs> kind of that sort of thing. And I was just when I started writing fiction, I thought, no, every sentence I write has to be true. It's just that when you're working with fiction, it's not factual. You know, and so every sentence has to be true. So you have to be very, very. I feel like I have to be very, very careful with every sentence I write. You, you, you've, uh, you suggested that uh, fiction is not an argument, and that there's no argument in this book. But there's a little passage that the <laughs> that you were kind of alluding to that seemed to me like an argument. So I'll, I'll give it to you, and you can no, it's do, not. do with what you, do what you want with it. Ethan, the the uh, a young boy who has a, a, an aptitude for painting, a really remarkable gift for observation of just the kind you're talking about, and, and an aptitude for painting. And he's given a painting book, and he's studying this for the first time. You know, a gift that he has, he's reading about it, and he says that he comes across in this book, colors to be used for flesh when painting portraits are flake white, yellow ochre, raw sienna, burnt sienna, light red, vermilion, raw umber, burnt umber, blue-black, terra verte, and cobalt. And I thought that in this passage, there was a kind of argument. He doesn't say white flesh, black flesh, red flesh. Right. He says flesh, and any kind of flesh has all these colors in it. And I thought this was an allusion to what I was pushing you out uh, a little earlier about the sense of an original mixture, not original purity, but original mixture. Am I on the right? Track. Yeah, I mean, and I th so there's all sorts of different, I think, ways of thinking, parsing that, because I've, my attention is on a 50 million different things, and I'm right. But on the on the one hand, you know, some of the, to me that is just that's that's not an argument; it's just a statement of fact. It's just because uh, I think not long they can after be powerful a, arguments, those statements of fact. Well, I think there's another line right after that that he's what he's watching is he, he he's now that he's looking at people with a painter's eye, he's noticing that literally everybody, and this is just true, like if you, if you, everybody's, the color of everybody, everything is changing every 
instant because we live in light and the light is always changing. Um, and I just felt like that was, a, that was an observation that I would let speak for itself. And that's another one of those right. things. I just, let, I just put it, it could, in there. It could be made into an argument. It could be, it but, could not, be, but by not by you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I mean, to me, that's, that kind of thing is, is like, those are the moments where you try to bring, and this, I'm trying to bring my readers into these, mo these profound moments of just like, here we are kind of at some stage, like, you know, together looking at this kind of something that's irreducible about human experience or mysterious as it were, in, in that sense of being irreducible. Or at some point, that, you know, you go past a threshold, you know, and to bring my reader there and then to tell them what to think of it would be fraudulence, it would be coercive. Unnecessary as well. Yeah, exactly, and and so that idea, and because at some point, if you're, I think if the story and the writing is working the way it should be, you pass beyond the threshold where anything even like explanation is available. Yeah. It would be by definition to explain something away, and if you do all this work of trying to like open up the complexity and the nuance of yeah. the world and the experience of it, you have to be very careful not to exactly. close it down for the reader, because yeah. that would actually be doing to the reader and 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 to the characters in the book exactly what the book purports to be against in the first place. Exactly. You don't want it to become an instance of the oppression it's trying to depict and dramatize but not participate in. This book, better than almost any other contemporary or recent book I can think of, kind of dwells in a zone of profundity and doesn't get out of it. And I want Don't to let that stop you from buying it. Oh, no. Please don't. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> One last passage. Uh, sorry to take up so much of our time by reading your own work, but it's your own fault. You write so well. Um, it's a little passage near the end. I'm just going to read, and then I'll draw attention to something that could easily escape your attention. Iha stepped off the raft and began to push at it and rock it back and forth. They're leaving the island. This group of people who have lived there for 130 years is being forced to leave the island, go to the mainland, many of them to the home for the feeble-minded. Okay. And the raft inched out from the shore and then beached again, then lifted and inched out a little more, then floated free on its own for a moment, and the girls thought they were launched and both began to cry, but the raft beached once more. Then the tide swelled up again, and Ea pushed the raft loose from the island. I draw your attention to this because there's about 60 or 70 words in there, of which about six are two syllables. All the rest are one syllable. And this seemed to me, if not deliberate, a kind of unconscious, perhaps, attempt to get to the roots of language itself, you know, kind of primordial forms of language itself. What do you have to say about that? I, um, I own two hard copy, multi-volume sets of the Oxford English Dictionary, the first edition and the second edition, and I literally read the dictionary every day. <laughs> and, and so I spend a lot of time, and this, that's not bragging, believe me, I don't, you know, like, this is, you know. Um, but, these are but very what, simple words. what I spend a lot of time doing actually is just re, just looking up common words, not the, not exotic words or anything like, that. but just and and a lot of those single single um, syllable words are you know they're old English in in origin, and the one of the qualities of words that we get from old English is that they are very embodied. You get like knee and heel and palm. And, Stone, stone, and so there's the, the imminent, just like imminent, it, 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 like the senses and and, and um, uh, embodied. Um, and I'm always that's one of the things, just one of the ways that fiction works, anyways, is that you're one of the ways that fiction persuades the reader um, is rather than through argument. It's not rhetorical in that sense, but is that it's to convince you that you're actually having an experience. That humans would have, and so those experiences are always based first in sight, sound. Was it taste like? What does it smell like? Was it way? Was it feel like? That sort of thing. So I'm always trying to embody these 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 moments so that I mean, the, an absolutely perfect reading experience would be that you're that you forget that you're actually reading words on a page, and that you just feel like you're it's experiential, it's felt. You know, you're just experiencing it, and that's what convinces you. Of it, or you know, of its authenticity, um, and just that you know that old, the the big old Oxford English Dictionary. One of the things that's amazing is this: you look up a common word in this twenty pages, and you get to see this is what it originally meant. This is what it means. You know, the one that I've been on lately is 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 temptation because temptation originally meant a true test of your worth or character, right. 
and then over time it became, it's actually a fraudulent. As fire thing. tests iron, so temptation tests the just man. Yeah, and the idea that you're, that you're actually lured into doing something. You know what something. the longest definition of the OED is? Set. Set, that's a good 20 one. 20 pages you, definition, yeah. small print. We have to open up the, uh, the floor for questions because oh. I'm sure there are some, and we've got a few. Be delighted, yeah. And I'm, by now you know, but I'm instructed to say that if you could please keep your questions succinct and end them with a question mark, then we'll, <laughs> then we'll make good progress. There was a hand right here. Actually, there's more than one hand right here. Please wait for the microphone. I read your book, and I read Tinker, and I loved them. Oh, th we're off to a good start. <laughs> that makes me happy. They are we're both <laughs> thought-provoking and disturbing. How many of these characters were made up, all of them? Yeah. And is there any way, of course, you don't know what happened to them. I mean, that's part of how the book goes on and on, what happened to whoever, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it was just fabulous. And so all of those names are fictitious. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you, you know. Uh, and, and did people come there in 1760, whatever? I mean, I know, I know the island's real. I know that the legislature um, issued a, an apology 100 years later. But all of them are Zachary Hand of God Proverbs <laughs> is really real? No. No. Okay. No, I, mean, I made all the, name, the characters. Not the tree. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a real, when I, um, when I was, uh, 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 when I first came across the, the historical story of Malaga Island, um, I read two or three articles about, about that. Um, and it grabbed a hold of my imagination so, you know, um, uh, tenaciously um, that I actually, once I knew that I wanted to start writing about a situation like that, I stopped doing any research because I didn't want because I immediately started thinking, oh, it's like the it's like the island in the tempest. It's like, you know, it's like the book of Genesis. It's like um, Herman Melville. It's like whatever you know, whatever all these different things. So I wanted to be able to freely sort of subject a story and set of characters to all those kinds of literary and poetic in influences, which wouldn't be appropriate if I was actually using the real names and trying to, you know. Um, and also, I had no connection to that actual island. And so the, 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 there's historical fiction and there's fiction that was inspired, you know. What, you know um, and so the, the, the documentary or the historical, the actual, hist an actually historical version of that story wasn't mine to, wasn't mine to tell. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, and, and some of the some of the characters, some of the plots were from. There was a character in Tinkers who actually sort of a lot of the plot that I gave to Esther Honey in this other Eden was a character who had a back plot in Tinkers that I had to cut out of the book, and I felt terrible about doing that. And so you know, so um, and so just all the different books are kind of intertwined in different ways. Yeah, yeah. I believe there was a hand here in front. Thank you. Um, I'm curious uh, about how are you? Do you write quickly? Is it automatic writing once you once you go down that trap door and and know who your characters are? Yeah, I write really really slowly. It just t you know, it took eight or ten years to write this book. Um, one of the ways that I uh, uh, managed to do that without just jumping out a window is um, I've just come to realize that what what we it, what, I, what is, I think, traditionally or commonly thought of as revision, you know, you write it and then you revise it and you think, oh God, I just want to write it. The revision is so lame or boring. And I, what I've come to realize is that what we call revision is writing. Yeah, I couldn't, you know, there isn't a sentence in any of the books that I've published that I haven't rewritten or looked at 150 times. And if, if you think that that's like the chore that you have to do after you've written it, you'll, you'll become a plumber or something like that, <laughs> right? But if you think, oh, I get to, I get to just keep working with language and trying to find, you know, 
how difficult it is to get a sentence that's true kind of in the way, but also just like how tough it is to write sentences that mean what they say and say what they mean, you know? And again, that, that, that idea of just going for absolute, you know, the, it's, it's, it's platonic because I'll never get there, but I love that idea of somewhere out there is the absolute perfect version of that book or that story, and I've got to try to bring it from, you know, the eternal and the perfect into English prose. And so just that becomes a really fascinating and engrossing project that will sustain me over eight years or 10 years or whatever without making me cuckoo. And also then, you know, you discover the characters, you discover you get more and more intimate with them over those years and then you just want to make sure that you do justice to them. You know, just become, you become implicated in their lives in the way that you'd be Come implicated in a friend's life or that sort of thing. Right here. Thank you. I was intrigued that uh, Bridget came from Great Blasket Island, an island that's uh, just as uh, remote and was last settlers uh, left in 1953. 53, I, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have uh, visited. So yeah. how did that idea come about for you? I visited Dingle the peninsula of Dingle in Ireland, and knew about that. I have friends who, who spend a lot of time there. Um, and I, again, that's another one of those kind of happy accidents. And you just, I mean, I'm a magpie when I write. I'm just like, ooh, I like that painting. Oh, look at that shiny piece of tinsel. And I just throw stuff into the manuscript kind of early on, and it doesn't have to do anything. I'm just sort of like, we'll see what happens if it's just ornamental. It'll, but so then that, yeah, that, and that there's just that resonance with Grand Blasket Island. And, and then that just became a kind of a lovely way for the, the two characters who have their romance. They rec they're, they're both sort of orphans. They've been sort of cast away from their homes. And the way that they recognize one another is they recognize the same little um, Irish lullaby that both of their families taught them, you know. Uh, so I just thought, that's great, you know. And one of the, I'm from Massachusetts, and one of, the, one of the interesting things about Grand Blasket Island, too, just in a sense, but I, got, I think I got it into the book, which is that um, a lot of the people who left Grand Blasket Island ended up in a, in, one, in a neighborhood in Springfield, Massachusetts. So I just thought that, you know, and again, with that, you know, oh, going back to the, the characters that in the, in the first, how the characters come and go, and then you don't know what happened to them. I get a lot of people saying, are you going to write a sequel? It's just like, nope, <laughs> nope, because we all know, you know, that um, that, that happens in life. There's, there's probably not a person in the audience who doesn't have, you know, remember that guy, Tommy? Remember Tommy down at the end of the block? Whatever happened to him? You know, and we become almost ghosts to one, you know. And I like the idea of just, there's my book, but people coming in and out of it in the way that they do in our real lives, you know. And so, and so to that also, just as many, as you want the, to, the world of the novel to be in a poetic way or artistic way, like almost to, to resemble the richness of our own experiences where you recognize things. That's the thing that I love just trying to reproduce for my readers one of my favorite experiences as a reader, which are those moments where, you know, you finish a book or a chapter or a passage or whatever, and you just put the book down and you just think, my God, that's absolutely true. And I've always known it's true. I never see anybody put it into language. I never see anybody put it into words. So that's what you just try to load it. So if, if you don't get Grand Blasket Island, there'll be something else and just keep opening it okay. up. You know? I think there was one, one over here. Yeah. Um, so I'm also a drummer, which is the same as you, and I was All wondering, right. um, when you drum, does that affect, like, how you write? Does that affect how your mindset is? I'm going to buy you a drink after the, <laughs> no, that, I can't just, no, that's, that, that, that's exactly, that's exactly what it was. So in, in that way that, like, what I, you know, it's sort of platonic, right? It's, I think of the, you know, just the, the, the signal comes through, you know. So when I'm, a, you know, when I'm at the drums, I'm sitting there with my drum, whatever, you know, in the world that it comes through. So you just start playing the drums. And so when I'm writing and I'm sitting at the laptop, it's the same thing, except it comes through into the world as words. Um, but I write uh, by ear. So that, you know, I think, what's the tempo? What's the time signature? You know, when you're a drummer, you, you, a drummer is known as the timekeeper. You're the keeper of time, and you can 
double it, you can have it, you can pull back against the tempo of the rest of the band, you can push on it, you can, make, you can do all those sorts of things with the way that you're, and when you're writing narrative, you're keeping time, and then, and then, and then. So yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Good question. We'll have one more. <laughs> we'll have one more, where is it? Right here? Thank you. Hi, and um, forgive me for taking a little time to set this question up. I live in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, mm -hmm. which has kind of been in the national eye uh, re recently. Our school board has been taking a lot of books out of schools, a lot of them being from award-winning authors like Toni Morrison, John Green. Mm -hmm. So as an educator and as an author who writes books with the content that they're saying is not Spotsylvania County material, mm -hmm. how do you handle these kids being denied having this kind of discussion, having this kind of experience with your books or with books with similar material? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's, well, it can never be a dead letter. It always has to be something that you're just thinking about kind of almost every day in almost every circumstance, you know? And so I'm a teacher. I, you know, I, I try to accept every invitation I can to go to public libraries, to go to churches, to go to any place where, um, you know, uh, I, I often go to smaller towns whenever I can, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and just, um, uh, um, I don't you know, it's hard to show. There are certain points early on in working with this book where not Norton, not the, not the people who actually ended up, you know, but early on there are some editorial suggestions about like, why don't you just make all the characters white? Talk about erasure, are you friggin' kidding me? And, you know, so there's a certain, there's a certain point where you just think, uh, you know, I'll eat prison food. <laughs> you know, and again, it's not a big, but I think part of it is just like, it's, it's just, you just, you're steadfast and that you just refuse to accept that kind of censorship and you refuse to exclude people. You know, I'm, um, in, in my, um, my teaching life, it's just one of the things I say, uh, you know, to you know, the students that we accept, and, and it's who you accept into your program too, and people who come from different kinds of um, backgrounds and situations, and it's been, it's taken time for me to sort of learn how to like look at applications and, and apply different metrics to whose application you take because they might not look good according to the traditional or the common metrics, you know, that sort of thing. And then just sort of have the attitude that um, no matter who you are, no matter what you're writing, I can help you make it closer to your own, what you want it to be. And just, you know, you, you know that. But I, it, this is, it's, you know, I've been doing lots and lots and lots of festivals and book touring and stuff like that. And it's just, it's, it's a subject that keeps coming, you know, especially the librarian, like God bless public libraries. They're one of the last bastions of democracy, right? It's true. And, and, um, and, you know, I know a lot of librarians that will go to prison before they, you know, and I think that's just what it is, is it's, it's just, it's kind of like, um, and, and partly it's just like my disposition, too. It's, it's just sort of like every day whenever anything comes up, if anything comes up like that during my day, I just, that's just that's absolute nonsense. Or you just, it's just sort of how you model just every single day, like, you know, these, you know, people, if anybody has, a, you know, is making an account of themselves and their experience of their humanity in the world in good faith, that their voice should be heard by anybody who chooses to seek their voice out or, you know, and a lot of people need to hear other voices. You know, I don't hear my own voice anywhere, you know, that's that sort of thing. Um, and so anyways, I'm just gonna keep talking, like we could just go on and on and on and on. But I think, I mean, for my part, that's just what I do, is it just, like, just in my teaching, in my book touring and all that sort of stuff, is just go around and just um, you know, try not to have anything to do with any of that baloney. And my, my wife's a teacher and her, she comes from a big Irish matriarchy and they're all you know, social workers, teachers, psychologists, all that sort of stuff. So I feel like I'm part, you know, then this, just, you just have to, it's kind of like a, just a steadfast, consistent, and long-standing just refusal to, to, you know, to, 
to um, countenance that baloney, you know. I don't know. I'm sorry. I that, that should have been a little more rousing. Shouldn't it? But no, but I mean, it is. I find it, it's just very sober. It's just a day-to-day and year-to-year. Because that's the thing is you want to be, just be steady and consistent so people can look at you and just say, that, that, that guy didn't sell out. That guy didn't betray anybody. That, that guy didn't, res- didn't have a lot of rhetoric and hot air. And then when things got a little funky, hightailed it out. You know, so. <clears throat> Paul, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you on behalf of everybody for coming and sharing this wonderful work with them. And I want to thank you for your ongoing support of the Charleston Literary Festival. With your backing over the last seven years, this is, I assure you, the most productive, most interesting, most fun, and most civic-minded institution of this kind in the country. Long may All right. Thank Thank you. you. And thanks to Eduardo. Thank you. thank you, Jeffrey yeah. Harper, and thank you, Paul Harding, for that meditation on process and presumption and the profound. So thank you so much. Thank you also to all of you, and a special mention to the sponsors of this event, Martha and O.P. Jackson. <laughs> and Pat and Jim Marino. So... Our conversations at Charleston Literary Festival don't just happen. They happen because of the support and the generosity of our donors and our sponsors. So thank you so much. Paul Harding is available to sign books after this session. So, and also the holidays are coming. So buy one for your granny and your auntie and your sister and your mum and have them sign them all. Thank you so much, everybody.